Welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 182, and quite possibly one of the most important episodes of Matt Chat ever. As you know, I've been doing this show for over three years now. I've recorded over 40 interviews with all manner of people in the games industry, publishers, programmers, developers, designers, marketing people, you name it. And I don't think any of those previous interviews matches the level of emotional intensity of the one you're about to see. Now, as you may know, Mr. Chris Taylor has launched a Kickstarter project called Wild Man, a fusion of the civilization-style game with the action RPG uh, genre, games like uh, Diablo and Dungeon Siege. Unfortunately, the Kickstarter project that uh, he launched has not gone well at all. Now, if, the, if he fails to meet his funding goal, it could mean the extinction of not only Wild Man, but also gas-powered games, uh, one of the best and most beloved uh, studios in the business. And it could also mean the end of uh, Chris Taylor's uh, career in the, as a game designer and developer. So the stakes really could not be higher. Uh, so as you're watching this video, if you think uh, that Chris and Gas Power Games and uh, Wild Man are things that are worth supporting, please uh, stop the video, go to Kickstarter, make the pledge as soon as possible, and then come back and watch the rest. Now at the end of this uh, interview with Chris, I'll have uh, Neil Halford on, who's also a uh, well-known uh, uh, game designer and developer, uh, to talk also about uh, Wild Men and why you should support it. We've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Chris Taylor. Well, so you haven't seen any of my updates on the Kickstarter. Why? Uh, what's what's going on? Oh, because I, uh, the Kickstarter is going so poorly that last Friday I laid off. In the fourth day, it was so dismal. I said, "There's really, it's really going to be a, it's really going to be a long shot to fund the, to fund it. It's a long shot." Now, I'm up for gambling. Like mm -hmm. I tell people, I'll jump off a two-story building, but I'm not jumping off a thirty-story building. Like that's just foolish. And I think what happened after that first week. Yeah, actually, you know what, well, we can just, uh, I don't know, we can jump into the thing here, uh, and I can tell a little bit of it, but um, to be honest with you, um, you know, uh, it would look so bad, I thought, well, there's no point in risking these folks' livelihood, and the only reason I was really upset in the video is because I really thought that when I lay them off, I'm not going to see them again. They're really gone, because they're going to go get jobs, they're talented people, and uh, that's going to be the end of Gas Powered Games. Um, I'm kind of shocked about all this because uh, you know I've done a lot of these kickstarters and it's, well they all did it really, like really they, well. they they take a long time it's always within like the last week that this suddenly this big rush. People ask me that they wanted to know why I felt so shitty after the fourth day and I said because if you don't if you look at the numbers compared to you you got to do side by side comparisons um, our numbers were off by an order of magnitude like a zero was missing. I mean, it would have been great if the thing had kicked off and I'd done 300,000 the first day and then 50,000 the second day and then it trailed off to junk because I'd say, well, we'll probably see the same 300,000 at the other end because that's how they generally go. But we saw $75,000. And the trouble is, is that a lot of games in this, in this category of, 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 of established game design studios who are asking for between 500,000 a million, they funded in the first day or two. The whole thing got to 100%. So when I saw them, when I was at like one, you know, one twelfth or one thirteenth, I realized there was something is wrong, you know? And I don't like to think of myself as a quitter. I didn't want to quit. We wanted to continue to fund it again. We had like 30 people, um, that could potentially be on the team, like, you know, that, that were from, a, that as the company was shrinking and downsizing, you know, we had 30 people. So I didn't know how many of those 30 people we were going to keep. Well, when the Kickstarter starts off and you have this terrible, terrible start, like I said, you're off by an order of magnitude. And you think, well, even in the absolute best case scenario, being a complete optimist, you're looking at losing probably half those people down to 15 people. So, then you then you have to do the math and say, OK, so I'm going to lay off 15 people. I'm going to hurt a lot of feelings and it's going to be it's going to be a really ugly situation. Uh, if you look at it and think, well, if, if it's so pessimistic that I'm, if I'm if it's so, if it's looking so poor, I may as well just clean the just clean the slate and then everybody gets what's coming to them. 
Uh, they get a fair shake to go out and get a job. Uh, they get their severance. They get their PTO. And when I say get their severance, I mean, a lot of folks just didn't get anywhere near what I would have liked to have paid them. Uh, historically at GPG, um, historically at GPG, we, we paid hardly any severance because the times were so tough back in 2006, 2007. And I gave people, uh, computers, I gave them chairs, I gave them anything I could as a sort of a, a, a say, call it, call it something, you know, instead of, instead of just thanks very much, have a nice day. Um, so this time around, we were trying to pay off the layoffs we did last year. We tried to give everybody a week for every year they were here, which was which is fine. But when you get into the deeper, deeper, you cut deeper into the company, your severance number goes way, way up because you're laying off people that have been here 12 years, 13 years. So you just can't you you can't do it when you're in when when you're in a tough situation. So we ended up giving a very we didn't end up honoring that to the to that extent. We couldn't. We could only pay a fraction of that. And uh, so I realized um, if you've been at a company for 12 or 13 years and you get no severance for that and you get your your PTO account paid out, which we asked everyone to keep their PTO, um, burn their PTO down. In other words, to help the company not carry a liability forward, we wanted people to go take the time off so that if things did get bad, um, we wouldn't have a that liability, and the trouble is, is that folks are so hardworking <laughs> that they want to stay and work, and so you're like, they didn't want to burn down, but that meant the runway of the company was that much smaller. So it was just like, my God, between all of these factors, I was just like, that that Kickstarter is just not going well enough because people are going to lose out, and they're not going to get anything close. They're going to just get their last paycheck. So, um, uh. I was uh, I was uh, in a tough spot, but anyway, I'm digressing. This is uh, this has been a rough this has been a rough couple of weeks, and um, um, to make the to uh, to finish here, um, we saw a little bit of a resurgence. We've been having conversations with folks, and we've been um, bringing them back with eyes wide open, as I call it so that folks can uh, arguably take some of the risk with the company and uh, uh, not put liability back into the company so we can kind of go through the project. But I was going to say, the, the thing that people uh, don't know is that I have friends that I listen to in the industry and I get their advice and I have some friends that are very passionate. And I got a phone call um, from a friend who said to me, uh, when I told him I was what that I was going to have to do a layoff, um, he said to me, "Well, whatever you do, you have to shut the Kickstarter down, because people are going to be upset that you're continuing to run the Kickstarter if you've laid off the team." So, I another friend, uh, I said to him, "Yeah, so I'm going to shut the Kickstarter down. My, I've I've got a very, you know, I've got some advice and some feel that, and I and I thought about it. And my, I thought, yeah, that." That makes sense. You know, people are going to be upset with me. My reputation is is out there. So my other friend said, oh, you can't shut the Kickstarter down. You're you're going to be screwed if you cut the Kickstarter down. People are going to hate you. They're going to think, why are you shutting the Kickstarter down? Um, they're like, um, uh, y y the reason you're doing the Kickstarter is to raise the money to pay the people. Of course, you can't have the people without the Kickstarter. So why, people should know that if the thing is successful, you will you will fund it. You will hire it. You will be able to build the team and the game. So I was just stuck. I, I called it Roe versus Wade. There is no right answer. You you have a group of people who are divided right up the middle, at least in my friend's minds. They modeled it. They modeled it out. And they're like, people will get upset. No, these people will get upset. And I was like, well, I'm just going to ask people. But I can't go to people and ask them unless they know the whole story because the story is going to leak out. I can't say to someone, should I keep the Kickstarter going or not and not tell them why I'm asking. So I have to tell people. And of course, at this point, I'm completely fried. It's Friday afternoon, and I've been having meetings all day long with people. There's tears, there's goodbyes, people are drinking. There's because of what's clearly evident. Nobody came into my office and threw themselves on the floor and said, no, Chris, this is going to work. This Kickstarter is going to be a success. No one said that. Nobody felt that it would. Even as we're talking now, the numbers are catastrophic. They're not even, and people people say to me, 
they got I've got a I think I've got a friend out there in the world someplace who has an who has a different spin on those numbers. The human race, I'm telling you, we're an optimistic bunch. But this is why businesses go broke because optimism. People think the money will come in the 11th hour, you know, and it's going to save their company. And it I know from experience. I know a lot of wealthy, powerful people. And I used to once upon a time believe that if I called them up in four in the morning, crying my eyes out, telling them that I needed to borrow a million dollars, that they would give it to me. I can tell you in my 15 years running the business, this is not true. Wealthy people are wealthy because they don't give their money away and they don't lend it to their wacky entrepreneurial friends who are always in trouble financially. You know, they just don't do it. So I realized that. So I said to myself, look it, I don't have any debt right now. The company doesn't owe any money. The best thing we can do is let people take their, uh, their make the decision to take their sevens and PTO. And if somebody, you know, uh, absolutely insisted, I said, well, why don't you come in on Monday and talk to me? And I, I kind of had it in my mind after they got the weekend to clear their heads. If someone came back and said, you know, hey, I've been thinking about all weekend, you know, I really want to figure this out, figure out how we I can stay stick with the company, but take the financial strain off the company. You know, I was willing to hear that. But my head was not terribly straight. Like I, 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 you know, in, in hindsight, to be fair, I should have held a company meeting and got everybody in a room and said, here's the story. But I know what would have happened. I think subconsciously, everybody would have said, yeah, we're going to do this. And then risk taking a giant risk. And I was like, no, 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 no. The human spirit does that. People, I, I call it charging the castle barehanded. People will do this. And this is not a smart thing, right? That does not, you know, you watch the, you watch the movie 300, right? And you think, oh, that's a really awesome movie. It's very heroic. King Leonidas, you know? No, that was dumb. He lost. He died. He doesn't get to see his wife and kid, right? And all these incredibly powerfully trained warriors all die. And they could have just gone back and regrouped with the rest of it. And because they, because they, because the, you know, and so it was, so to me, it was like, no, 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 this is not the Alamo. You know, I am not Davy Crockett. Santa Anna, you can have it. And I'll be back another day. That's how I felt. That's what, that's where my, that's where my head was at. So anyways, we're here now. Uh, we've got some folks back. Um, and, uh, we're going to, um, we're going to, uh, wait and see what happens with the Kickstarter. And, uh, we're going to go ahead uh, if it if it funds and if it doesn't fund, we're now we're now emotionally and mentally and hopefully for many financially prepared to deal with the consequences of that. There you go. Yeah, I mean, I'm a surprise. Uh, really, uh, I thought you know I've worked uh, with the what was it Dave Marsh on the Shadowgate campaign and the the, uh, the Rogue Redemption campaign, a lot of these other ones, and uh, you know 300. I don't know what percentage 320,000 is. <laughs> Not too good at the math right now, but that seemed like a, you know, a decent percentage just for still got 21 days left to go. You know, I'd be expecting a, a huge surge as you get into like the 7 7 day, 6 day mark. But hold in there. Oh <laughs> so yeah. I'm definitely going to come down on the on the side of the guy that said, "I uh, just give it a little longer, you know." Well, if you think about it now, with the folks that are in here, there's about 13 people on the Wild Man team and some admin. If the, fun, the game funds, then we'd only go out and have to hire two more people because that's all we'd have money for. Uh, now I'm ballparking it, you know, um, so a 15-person team. Uh, and then what you do is you try to we, – we, we restructure around the notion that some people, a lot of people aren't going to get full pay. And we're going to um, probably have to work a lot with the community, uh, the people, the backers. A lot of people said they'll test the game. And so, you know, I, I'm, I pull a lot of numbers out of my ass. I'll be honest with you. But I do think ballpark, um, we thought if we got to 2 million or 3 million, like a lot of the other games, you know, we'd have, we'd have the, everybody would have a job. So we were very hopeful. Now, that may be called uh, foolish optimism, but it was just... It was just going by the patterns. Um, 
games cost a lot of money to make like this. So I think, uh, you know, we, we got uh, the writing was on the wall there in the first day that it was probably if at very best, it was going to be, um, it was going to be 1.1, but, re but remember the commissions come out of that. So you only have a 1 million, then you have physical goods coming out of that, which, you might be able to defer some of that until closer to the end, but you still money's money. You still have to have the money to pay for the physical goods. So that has, you have to carve that out of the amount. So the amount is not $1.1 million. And believe me, when you're making a game like this on a tight budget, uh, every penny has to be accounted for. Uh, I had reconciled, or I'd, pardon me, I had, uh, what's the word? I had uh, accepted the, the fact that I would probably go without pay for the bulk of this. Uh, and just use my personal savings, which is not lots, but you know what? I was like, I was thinking if we can get this game to market, then maybe that'll be a turning point for GPG. Uh, and that we'll finally see some royalties. I've, we've shipped, uh, many titles, um, that have sold a million copies and we have not had a royalty stream from those games. Um, people are shocked. I tell people, no, you understand when you, when you get a royalty advance from a company, at uh, 20% as a round number, you're really getting a 500% loan. You have to earn in royalties now. Um, if you borrowed a million dollars, they're called advances. If you got a million dollars, you now must pay back $5 million uh, after all the deductions from the game. So if the game sells for $59 or $50, there, there's cost of goods, there's insurance, there's freight, there's returns, there's marketing, they call it MDF, deduction, 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 and then you get a piece that's left, which could be $30. And now you get your 20% of $30. So now you get six bucks and you have to pay back the advances with $6. Under this structure, the publisher, of course, um, makes all of its investment back, pays for all of its internal costs, profits, has a healthy profit, then the developer will get paid. This is called advances against royalty model. This model, by the way, is uh, was was taken from the recording industry, from what I understand. You ever heard the old stories where the guys, um, the rock and roll band that was no that was nobody's, you know, the the, the record label um, uh, uh, funded their album in the studio. And then, and then they got, they sold millions of records, but on the tour, they destroyed every hotel room they stayed in. Uh, so that when the record company said, well, when you take the, take the record sales and you deduct this and this and this and this and this, and you get down to your royalty that you made, you still owe us about $2 million. <laughs> I love that because now we don't wreck hotel rooms. But um, we do drink a lot of soda pop, I have to say. So um, Especially Izzy, as I recall. <laughs> yeah, we drink a lot of Izzy. No, we don't. We, um, they're too expensive. I mean, that's the reality, right? I mean, we drink, a lot of, we drink a lot of terrible soda pop because it's like 50 cents a can, and Izzy's are a dollar a bottle. So we try to we, – we do have our Mexicokes. So um, anyway, I digress. But the, the, uh, uh, the long story short is a, advances against royalties model is a terrible model. Uh, uh, and you can make quite success. You can be quite successful in your own mind. If you can sell a million copies, people will look at you like you are, you should be rich, but in fact, you're looking for your next deal to fund your company. This is the way, and this, and you know, this is, a, this is just industry wide. Now, what people have tried to do is they've tried to come up with models where you get to pay, you get paid like a flat fee, like, and I've actually been a fan of this, you know, like when the game goes to market, you get 5%. You know, you get 10% and people are like that number feels low. But when you look at the fact that you'd be sent, you'd be paid on copy one that was sold, at least you're going to get a check, you know? Um, but uh, the, the, so the business is really hard. Any developer will tell you the business is really hard and we've had good times and we've worked with some incredibly uh, generous publishers. Um, uh, I have to say, and the people in those publishers, the individuals, uh, some of them are just wonderful and feel your pain and they're, they're inside of a structure. And, and you know, it, it's always comical to me uh, when one of those guys inside a publisher goes out and starts a game development studio and then you talk to him like three years later, four years later, and he's just, he's like, just, just, just I can't believe how hard this is. 
holy shit, this is hard. And um, I go, yeah, like it's 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 sort of a, it's sort of, I don't know, is the word vindicating? I don't know. It's kind of satisfying. I mean, it's to to. It's like a German that, word for that, Schadenfreude or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, that German word, but that that's more revengeful. These are not people that I don't like. These are people that I uh, I really like. I really like a lot of folks in the industry. You know, even people that really piss me off in the industry, I still like them because there's something about them that I appreciate. Um, it's, it's, it's a character flaw of mine to like people as much as I do. I think, I think, I think, um, I think that I'm always trying to make people happy and like me and always have a good experience when they work with me. Um, that does not make for a good businessman, the good, good businessman. I, I, I said it before Steve jobs, he's the archetype of what you need to do to succeed in America. You need to be able to really break your foot off in people's asses if they don't give you what they want, what you want. And um, I can't do that. I, I don't have that. I can't sleep at night being an asshole all day long. I mean, I've read every almost I mean, I'm going to go on a limb and say that I've read every book on Steve Jobs. It's like six or seven or eight uh, just just autobiographies, biographies. I just read them all. And I just was fascinated with him. He He just... Every time I read it, the book, I read the same story, but, but told from a different writer. And I was always like, how did he sleep at night? How does he sell Apple and not give valued employees stock? Steve Wozniak is running around giving his, giving these guys stock behind, behind his back. And he's pissed at Wozniak. Like, don't give them stock. They don't deserve stock. And I'm just going, my God, I give stock to everybody practically that I brought into the company in the early days. I mean, we... We basically had to st get, get, stop giving stock to people because it was too expensive to give stock. Like all the corporate documentation you have to do, all the legal fees. I would just as ra rather have written it on a note, piece, uh, on a post-it note, and said, "Here, you get some stock because it would have saved the company hundreds of thousands of dollars in a a in fees." But um, where'd you park your car this morning? Underneath the, in the garage. Why? <laughs> as long as it wasn't in the handicap spot. So. It Oh, that's where well, jobs like to park, as I hear. What's that? Oh, I started Steve Jobs would park in the handicap spots. Oh, I get what you're saying. Oh, that's that's funny. Where did I park my car? <laughs> Woo! You threw me there. <clears throat> hey, I need a coffee too. You, I, I, I uh, I've had nothing. I, I, uh, my wife's away right now, and uh, she normally makes me coffee in the morning. And for whatever reason, getting the kids off to school, and um, uh, one one of my kids' shoes was out in the yard. The, he, he, <laughs> I was like, where's the shoe? And so I'm out like looking, I tore the whole house apart. I was like, where's the shoe? The shoe has to be in the house, right? <laughs> Shoe's out in the yard because he threw it at his brother yesterday because he wouldn't let him have a bite of a, of, a, of a dried piece of bread. I mean, these are a six-year-old and a 10-year-old. They're just crazy, yeah. right? Like, I think they get it from their mother. <laughs> but anyway, I was, uh, um, I was rambling is what I was doing. And, uh, and I tell you, uh, uh, being, trying to be, trying to keep everybody on your team, trying to keep everybody happy, trying to keep the bills paid, trying to do these deals with the publishers, it will tear you in half. And I've done it, uh, for 15 years this May, that's our 15th anniversary. And I think wild man is, um, is going to be a lot of work, uh, if we get it funded, but I think it could be a turning point for me. Because I would like to see uh, the company uh, get that game to market and generate uh, income that doesn't have any deductions and it doesn't we don't owe anybody any money. Uh, therefore, we can keep building that game and building that game and actually start generating real revenue and, and really become a real a real business. You know, if you run a grocery store, you you're running a real business. You sell a loaf of bread, you make money. You don't owe. You don't. You know. It's not this, this ridiculous sort of scheme that we're in here. So that, that's, that's, my, that's my ramble. Well, let me tell you about some of the fans, uh, the fans' passion. Sound like you could use a, a, some good news, right? Uh, you know, when the Wild Man Project first, or when the Kickstarter first launched, I think I had maybe four or five messages in my, my email. But, oh, you got to go check out this game. We've got we to get Chris Taylor back on to tell us about this. And have you pledged? Have you pledged? And I said, yeah, of course, you know, I pledged a, you know, the, I think it was, what, $35 for the uh, digital copy? And uh, one of the fans just jumped in like this and said, that's not good enough, you need to get the box copy, and sent me a donation of like 150 bucks right on the spot. 
I just to bump, you know, for me to bump my pledge up to the, you know, box copy level. So obviously there is a lot of enthusiasm for this uh, project out there. Well, that's, to me, that's, that's, that is an emotionally, that, that really sets me off those stories. And, um, uh, I, there's nothing more. Yeah. There's nothing like, like, just give me a, give me a second here if you can. Sure. Oh, uh, uh, but you know, uh, the, the 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 support from people who really seem to understand what's going on is just really really moving, and you got to remember it's just video games we're talking about here. Well, there's people in the world that don't have clean drinking water. There are people that don't that are dying from diseases that are curable if they just had the medicine. Right, um, yeah. Th this is video games. This is video games. What the hell are we doing? Why are we losing our focus here? My 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 uh, uh, my wife's mom, who's an incredible woman, is has been baking banana bread to build an orphanage in Uganda for this past year and a half, I guess, roughly. She's put everything she's got into it. She's retired. She's 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 sixty seven, um, and she's just a just an incredible amount of energy in this woman. And 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 she went and did an Indigo to build the wall for twenty thousand dollars. And I think she got to ten. I don't remember ten or ten or eleven thousand. She didn't get to twenty. And she got an Indiegogo. There's a setting where you can take pay ten percent and get the money if it doesn't fund. That option isn't available on Kickstarter, and I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have selected it because if you don't have the, the enough money to do it, you don't have enough money to do it. But I again, I'm I'm off topic here. So she 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 struggled. It was it ran for three months, and she managed to get to ten or eleven or something thousand dollars. Um, actually, I, I apologize because I don't remember because I, I just uh, it's been a busy time for me as well. And the um, the thing is, we get to seventy five thousand dollars in the first day. Because video games, you know, frankly, are more important than building a wall for a, around an orphanage. If they don't build this wall around the orphanage, uh, there's a chance that the kids will be abducted and um, and and they'll never see them again. These kids are are it's not. I don't even want to mention what happens to these kids. And uh, you know, you kind of have to put your life into perspective. You know, Wild Man doesn't have to fund for my life to go on. I will, I will go and do something else. You know what I mean? I'll, maybe I'll be a professional whiner and complainer about the business <laughs> if people want to hear me bitch about it. But the truth is, is that, um, God, you got to keep stuff in perspective. So this this outpouring of support um, ah, has been wonderful. I got I, uh, a, a Felix. I'll keep his last name anonymous, but he wrote me a metal a wild man tune. I believe it's metal. The guys at the office say it's metal. It's pretty it's pretty. It's pretty intense. Um, uh, I'll send you a copy. He said we can have it, um, and maybe we can play it at the end of the bit, uh, end of the show or something like that. Uh, I, I loved it. I think it's awesome. He brought me to tears, of course, because of his his thoughtfulness. It's the thought. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, I mean, we've had such a great run for 15 years even though it's been painful at times it's been good at times there's been some good money made in there um not enough for independence but certainly enough uh to uh to have toys and goodies to have have new laptops and uh have uh um you know some laughs so you know what it's it's not all bad you know you can't you can't it's the friendships frankly it was the saying goodbye to people who 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 I wouldn't see every day i didn't give a shit about the money my, I had, you know, something, since I'm on, since I'm rambling my face off, people should know I've turned down multiple opportunities to sell the company. We're talking in the 20s of millions of dollars. 
many, many offers. And invariably, I said no. We did have one acquisition go almost to completion, but it got complicated along the way because we thought we found a partner um, that it would work. But at the end of the day, we never did. We never did end up selling the company. And I don't regret that. There was days when I'm like, I can't make payroll. I'm thinking, God, you know, $20 million would be great right now. <laughs> but of course, if you sell the company, you don't need to make payroll anymore. But um, the, uh, the, point, the point is that it wasn't about the money. I'm just not a guy who chases money. I love going to the store like everyone else and buying this and buying this and buying this. But um, you have your kids, you have your family, you have your home. Uh, those are the priorities. If you can pay for those things and have food in the cupboards, that's what matters. Uh, so uh, I try to I try to stay focused around that. Um, but uh, no, I mean I've took uh, we spent we spent one point four million on kings and castles, and we needed six, and we almost got the game signed. And then we went, excuse me, we went to work on Age of Empires Online because of a risk management we knew that age of empires online was going to be a ton of fun and it was going to be uh um uh, uh secure and and it, we all we were fans of the game uh, or we could have bet the company then and you would have heard me i would have been on your show <laughs> you know in, in november of 2010 with a story like this and you and no but it was delayed and, and you know what i can't tell you uh, how much I appreciate what Microsoft did for us. Microsoft saved GPG or, or, or took the odds of, of, of losing GPG from about a 90 percentile chance down to zero. I mean, they really, they really saved my ass. I mean, you don't know how many times I walk through this office and saying when people are frustrated and they're running around and they're trying to get, you know, stuff made. I'm like, remember, they saved our ass. <laughs> you know, keep it in perspective. Uh, they really did. And we thought we'd, um, we thought the economy would improve and things would shift. But man, alive, video games, man. Uh, I saw a number this morning. Uh, more sales are down. More, you know, all the percentages are, are, are dropping. And uh, we're in transition. There's, there's new players coming in. They've got, you know, this guy over here has got a billion dollar a year business. This guy here is asset sale. You know what I mean? And you're like, wow, where well, these guys are selling their assets. You think of these guys with all the money would step in and just save them. But they're like, no, that's not how the game is played. This is business. There's no saving anyone. You don't save things. You, you let things die that need to die and you let the things succeed that are supposed to succeed. This is called capitalism. This is what our country is built on. And if you, if you, if you, fiddle with capitalism if you start turning the knobs and dials if you start subsidizing things you screw everything up you know when i i heard that corn syrup was so successful uh in years in the last 10 years that cane uh sugar sugar cane growers lost their businesses you know because everybody was buying corn syrup so i'm like what did that subsidy really accomplish and then we get breast cancer and colon cancer and prostate cancer and all these cancers and we don't know where they come from. And I'm like, e really? You don't know where they come from? It's the, the shit we eat, right? Like, it's just, this is the problem with this country. It's, it, 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 hey, it took us 10 years to figure out that, 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 that there's too much shit in our food and we've got to start eating food that's grown in farms where we live. And, you know, that was like, to me, just like, I'm, I'm just going, yeah. So I've always believed that that you have to let the, the natural system play out. I would like right now for people who cannot afford, who pledged on Wild Man, who increased their pledges and pushed themselves out of their comfort zone to take those pledges back. They cannot pledge their the last nickel in their in their savings. It's just not okay to do that. Now, if they want to, because it makes them feel good and it's giving them more than what they would have spent that money on, then it's their choice, of course. But I don't think Wild Man should be funded on the generosity and kindness of people because they feel bad. Um, it should be funded instead because people are just basically, you know, investing investing in a game. Uh, I have to tell you, though, because I'm, since I'm just completely rambling, talk about not rambling. getting a word in edgewise. <laughs> this, this could be the best 
this could be the most <laughs> outrageous show you've ever had. It might, it might do, it might do good numbers just for, just because of pure ridiculousness. Okay. Um, I was telling a member of the press, uh, uh, who was very kind to listen to me tell, tell the story. Um, and I said to him, you know what? I don't want people pl pledging. And he said, he said to me, Chris, people are not investing in wild man, the game. They are investing their money in the spirit of Kickstarter. Um, because they're investing in you and your game design and your company, and they want to see the next Chris Taylor game. That was their, that was it. I said, holy shit. I said, that's a, that, you're, that's a, that's beautiful. Can I use that? <laughs> and I, he said, yeah, sure. Go ahead. I said, actually, I'd love to get you on a video blog saying that because a video update, because, uh, because I, I, you're saying something that I have a hard time saying, but I think by, by, by quoting him kind of paraphrasing him, I think that you get what I'm the value of it, which is that, um, that people can in, are on Kickstarter really shouldn't be pre-ordering a game. They should be investing in people who they want to see continue to do what they do. Um, uh, so uh, I said, okay, okay, I'm going to lay off that. You know, I'm not going to get down on people if they if they're if they're pledging two hundred dollars and they can only afford twenty. Okay, I'm, I'm going to back off that. But you would not. I got to tell you something else. The no, I get to see the pledges, right? I get to go into the account. And I get to see who they came from. There is so many pledges from my friends and family that I really know they're never going to play Wild Man. <laughs> so I just like, I'm just like, okay, I better, I better, this better work. I, 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 you know, when, you know, my dad, um, called me up and told me that he's pledging. I just was like, I just was shaking my head and I was like, I don't, I don't know, but God bless him for, you know, I'm not religious, but God bless. Him. <laughs> okay. You know, your turn. Yeah. It sounds like you're a little uncomfortable with the whole Kickstarter, uh, setup. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's no question about it. Uh, I, actually said to uh, Chad here, I said, Chad, you know what? We should never have put a $10,000 tier, anything over, you know, frankly, anything over $125. Um, I had a friend email me and he said, you better put a really high tier in so I can put a lot of money in. Here's the thing. You can put up to $10,000 in and buy a $125 tier. You can call me on the phone and you can say, Chris, I want to I want to invest in GPG. Chris, I want to lend you a hundred grand privately. Like, like really, I didn't need the $10,000 tiers, but people, unfortunately, what they do is they see that and then they feel like there's an onus put on them to see how high their, their pain threshold is. So in hindsight, no more, no, I wouldn't have put it in. And if I ever do this again, which I, I don't want to never say never, but, um, uh, I would keep the tiers down to a level where you kind of feel like people can't, are going to lose their rent money because they're caught up emotionally. Like I'm actually fearful of the last two days of this campaign. I'm fearful that if it's at $980,000, that $120,000 is going to come from people I love. I do not want that to happen. I will call people up who have pledged and tell them to get rid of that pledge because no, this thing should fail if it's destined to fail. I am not, I, I, it's not even about pride. It's about care for people. Forget my pride. Forget my ego. Holy shit. My ego left the building last Friday when I, when I made that game. I mean, any, any, anything I had left was gone. So uh, it's, all about, it's all about just protecting people you love, really. And again, remember, this is just a video game. So let's not, let's not lose that, you know. I Yeah. So is this Matt Chat or Chris Chat today? Ah, well, you know, people will be tuning in to hear you, not to, not for me. So uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, you're very nice, a nice guy to have these uh, these attitudes. I think it's, uh, I think it speaks well of you that you're not uh, just out there uh, using, you know, please send me everything, and uh, <laughs> maybe we can hit a five or six million dollar. Uh, what do they call it when you go beyond the minimum goal, the uh, stretch goals, and so on? Yeah, we can't get to stretch goals. 
see a lot of my friends and the, and, the, and, the, and these guys i mean they were worried doing kickstarter but they got to their goal within a couple of days so then they started into stretch goals and you can really drive a frenzy when you have friends to stretch goals it's like the game is on right then know that you know the game's coming so when you pledge after the goal is met you know the money is spent you can retract it but you know you're pledging for something that's going to happen well we can't even talk about our stretch goals i mean we have stretch goals to go to linux to go to mac uh, the game is the game's design fundamentally could be played on a mobile platform like a like a, a, a an i uh, an iPad so on, but we can't even get to that. It's ridiculous to talk about that when we're at three hundred. So there's this there's no stretch there's not we're not going to get to a stretch goal. So uh, uh, you know those guys really caught it's like surfing they caught the wave and they surfed it in and they looked good the whole way. I was paddling out in the water and a wave came in. And threw me onto the the hot dog shack, and my feet are sticking out like this. And I'm like, okay, okay, let's. Do, what next? Who are uh, which of these Kickstarter projects are you comparing yourself to? Um, you know, I don't really necessarily want to say, but you know, all, pretty much the guys who are, um, you know, you could figure it out. They're the they're the um. I mean, it's not that I don't want to say it's 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 just that I don't want to draw I don't want to draw any negative attention. I think that, that this whole thing feels like it's got a negative energy surrounded to it, not a positive energy. Um, and so I don't want to do that. But um, you can figure it out real fast if you just go on Kickstarter and do a search. I got three. I got you know three or four projects that I'm you know wondering. But anyway, I, maybe we could back up a little bit and just say why did you choose uh, to fund uh, Wild Man through a Kickstarter? campaign to begin with you know that's a great question because it leads to a really important series of events we lost we had three projects last year and uh people asked me they said hey when are you going to go to kickstarter with kings and castles and i said well I'm, my studio is completely busy we have 80 people and we're all busy well we lost all those projects inside of eight weeks so all the projects were canceled and uh they were canceled uh for reasons i like to believe had nothing to do with us um that's what i'm told um, I was told, uh, to quote one person, um, you guys were great. Uh, there's nothing you did, uh, internal changes, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Those are sort of the, I could do a coffee table book on things publishers say that try to make you feel better. <laughs> and you know what? And God bless them, right? These are, some of these people come over and give me the speech are good friends, let alone the publisher. So, um, we then had about five publishers that we were talking to about getting some more work. And one by one, those publishers called to say that either they're restructuring, that their management is unsure if they want to move in that area. Um, some people just don't call you back. You know, you know, Brian Fargo's video, Wasteland 2 uh, video. I tell you, if you have not seen it, you should go watch it because it's still up there. He does a little parody of what it's like trying to sign a game. And um, it's it's hilarious because it's so close to uh, – it's a parody, but it's so in, in spirit. It really models it. And the problem that – the biggest problem I have with publishers is when they kind of know they don't have any money, like the smaller ones – uh, they come by and they spend a day at the office and they talk and talk and talk. And then what they do is they ask you to do a proposal. So you spend anywhere between a week and a month of someone's time and sometimes multiple people on the team. And this costs you, you know, arguably tens of thousands of dollars to put a proposal together. And then they tell you that they're not interested. They're moving in a different direction. So can you imagine what it's like trying to run a business where you have to spend into you know, you have to spend money speculatively. Uh, I call it skirt lifting. I have a name for it. It's not a very good name. It's probably right up there with binder full of women. But I tell you what, um, it just feels like you just after you've just you've been violated on some level. You know, it's it's like you, you just think you just think, God, would you stop it? Get your hands off. Like, you know, like, don't touch me. You know, like, stop that. D damn it. Because you're just taking away. You're not, you're not even going to buy me dinner, you know? Well, actually, sometimes they do buy you dinner. But, you know, <laughs> it's a $200 dinner, <laughs> and it costs you $40,000 in, uh, in design documentation and phone calls, 
in, in, in overhead, right? You know, so anyways, maybe, maybe that maybe we should include that in the video. What do you think? <laughs> I love that part. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the reality. It's called business development, right? You have to develop business. It costs money to develop business. It's why when you're a couple of guys in a garage and you're going to start a company, you have no overhead. You have no overhead. So you can business, the first business that you develop has no co overhead costs associated to it. You might even have another job and you're doing it weekends and evenings. But now you have, a, you have an office. You've got a rent. You've got insurance. You've got all these costs. And you've got a team of people that you're carrying. And you're now waiting for that next deal to come in. It's called, you have to bridge, which means the dollars from the bridge has to come in from profit from the previous deal. Well, that cost, that could cost, that could be a million dollars, $2 million. Well, you, it's really hard to build $2 million into a deal with the publisher saying, well, you're not spending that money on the game. Why are we going to give you that money? And you're like, oh yeah, I guess I can't. So you have to have profit. And if you don't have profit, you're, 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 you're basically going to do what I've done for 15 years. You're going to go hand to mouth for deal to deal. And that forces you to do bad deals because the lawyer on the other end is pushing a term and you have to cave in on those deal terms because you don't have any money to sustain the company. There's a name for this. It's called, um, and I'm going to just think of it. Um, uh, I, there's what, what, okay, it's called drying, drying the other guy out. Okay, that's one term. I'm sure that I'm sure Donald Trump has another term for it, but um, I'm sure. Actually, I'm sure that I'm sure the guys out of Harvard call it. Or is it? What, where, where, where's all? Where's the the hotshot business guys come from? I think they call it American business. Uh, but what it's what I call it is drying the other guy out because the longer you sit and kind of ch chat, you basically that company that you're dealing with has put all its resources into that single game. I mean, pardon me, that single deal. And then you have to finally sign and take whatever terms they offer because you have no money left to run the company. It's drying the other guy out. What a great idea that is. Did I did I shock you by ending ending with a <laughs> monologue for an hour? Yeah. So, uh, caveman. I'm sorry. A wild man as a Kickstarter. You know, I guess this arose just kind of out of a uh, desperation, would you say? Or, I mean, had you gone to publishers with the concept and they were just proved to be too expensive with the design documents? And... You know, that's that's probably where I um, I get you know in my, into myself into a little bit of trouble. Um, Wild Man was a game that I designed for a, uh, a platform I called Project Mercury, and uh, Wild Man was so basically it was supposed to run on a web browser. Um, but then we realized after all the projects were canceled that we needed something that we could take to Kickstarter and Kickstarter wasn't even the first idea. Kickstarter was like an idea that we would have with all the other publishers that, that slowly fell away, uh, and what for one reason or another. And, um, so, so we kicked wild man into high gear, just started putting everybody working on that. And, um, um, uh, gosh, I almost forgot the question now. Uh, Maybe while we're on this, uh, where did the idea originally come from? Oh, so it was, it was, so it was. Uh, I, I pull, I like to pull a lot of the ideas that I have out of my ass. That's where all great ideas are born. Um, no, I'm kidding. That was just. <laughs> oh, frankly, uh, I should have. I should just qualify it, and then it would be true. It's where all of my great ideas are born. Okay, I don't think your great ideas, Matt, are born in my ass. Okay. Although I'm happy to lend you some of mine <laughs> if you're short um, some. But anyways, um, my uh, wild man just was me doodling like I do on the, on the, on the whiteboard or on the, my, my paper here in my office. And I was thinking about how I could build something that would stream because I had to – the thing is with web technology is, is you've, got, you've got limited CPU, but you really have limited um, – uh, you, you don't have an installation footprint. So you have to pull the stuff down from the server and then you get the browser caches and you've got a couple of things. So when you put all these constraints of the way a browser works, you start uh, to me that sort of defines how the game should work. So I, uh, that's where the, the idea of doing an action RPG that takes place, that streams over this world. But um, it was Chad who came to my office one day. I think it was Chad. And he said, hey, you know what? Um, 
uh, there's an opportunity here to do something with uh, that's sort of similar to what people know as a MOBA, but not MOBA, but something where you can do things with. And I thought, that's great. So I started doodling around and um, came up with this whole idea of the war zones that fit inside of an action RPG. Uh, so it's a it's still a team effort, you know, on that level where I take ideas from people because they walk into my office and effectively I tell them what I'm doing. I say, look at this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And then they say, oh, you thought of this, if you thought of this, if you thought of this. And then what I do is my my job is to kind of filter out the ideas and come up with something that, that all fits together, holds together. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's still it's still really my ass. I my, my ass is a team is a team effort. Um, it's either my balls or my ass. Do you notice that that comes up in conversation? If only the two could be combined. God. <laughs> what? Well, yeah. So, um, so the, uh, where am I going with this? So that's where wild man came from. So we started working on wild man, but we didn't, we didn't say, uh, Oh, Oh, I remember your question. Your question was, do we take it to publishers? Well, I started to noodle around the idea that I should float it past publishers, but my feeling was, you know, they're not going to sign this. They're going to just look at it. They're just going to see the idea. I'm going to spend, I'm going to fly on a plane down to this city and that city. I'm going to sit in a boardroom. I'm going to waste, you know, collectively I'll waste a week of my time. They'll tell me all the same thing that I've heard uh, in the last four or five years. And um, they'll want to own it. They'll want to own the IP. And I'll work my ass off. And I'll be back right back where I started uh, a year or two later. And then it's just GPG will be 17 years old, and I'll be on Matt Chat telling this story. It's a vicious cycle. You, ha I have to break the cycle. So here's what I'm here's what I'm going to do. If if it doesn't fund, and if if, if, my, if a white knight doesn't charge through the door with a checkbook, and says, "I saw you on Matt Chat, and I'm so rich <laughs> that I just don't know what to do with my money until I saw your video and I realized our fates were, you know, whatever." I'll say, great. But that's not going to happen, Matt. I, 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 I dare the universe to prove me wrong, okay? And the universe and I are good friends. And the universe isn't going to make me look bad, okay? And have someone charge in there with money and say to me, oh, by the way, I'm just going to give you this money for 10%. Or I'm just going to give it to you because out of the kindness of my heart. And uh, so, um, uh, so I knew that I couldn't just go to publishers, although I did email one. And they showed some interest, but what they what they do is they 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 show interest in everything. A publisher will never close the door. I was talking to um, uh, a friend of mine, and he said when I ran a publishing company, he said and somebody came in and showed me a shitty idea, I would turn to them and say, "We're not interested in this idea. Have a nice day." And he was really proud of that. And I tell you what. I am too of him because I, you show a publisher the worst idea. You say, I've got marshmallow guys and they spit acid, but they're deployed from an airplane, which is cloaked. They'll say, could you, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep in touch. You know, can you send us some documentation on that? When you guys get to a, uh, a first playable. We'd like to see that. See, what they do is, is they don't want to close doors because when Battlefield 1942 from DICE in Sweden went around all the publishers, they all, they all took a look at it and they probably gave them their sort of like their line of, well, come back later. But then someone else signed it and, you know, and, uh, and the, uh, it was the, um, it was Tom Frazina's group at CIDA that signed it. And that's a victory, right? Like, whoa, they signed it. But everybody else is like, oh, God, why didn't we sign Battlefield 1942? And um, so they're always trying to make the person they're talking to think that they're going to sign it in order to keep the door open while they're convincing their management to, 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 that they need to, to put this game into the, into the, into their, uh, onto their slate. And that leads to a lot of businesses going under. That whole practice. I mean, one of the things I think about when I'm looking at these Kickstarter games is uh, here's a game that wouldn't have been able to be uh, funded through the traditional, you know, avenues available. Uh, here's it's probably unique in some fashion. It's probably something that people who really care about gaming should 
invest in if they do want to see some uh, diversity, some things that haven't been done a million times, the, the not-so-safe bets, right? Uh, so uh, what do you think a wild man has uh, to offer that you're just not going to get uh, from a, the traditional published game? Well, we we really stacked the deck there. I mean, we've got a game that we've got, uh, we're making it so that you can mod this game. I mean, let me actually talk about high-level features. you got an action RPG game. Now, action RPG has been done to death, but people love it. So it's one of those tough situations. Like, if you love first-person shooters, would you like it if I made you another first-person shooter? It's like saying you like cheeseburgers so much, and I'm going to start a cheeseburger stand. It doesn't make sense. It has to have a hook, right? So the trouble is, is that it's got to be the same, but it's got to be different. So Wild Man is the same action RPG game, except that your character collects technology like civilization when he starts off with a big bone he's got no tech he's just got a bone and he <clears throat> now the guy he packed in drops this club that's been nicely fashioned with this and it's got a little hand grip on it and he picks it up and he goes yeah I got a better toy here to play with. And he, right? Okay, that's where we began 200,000 years ago. Now, I thought that was a really fun story to hang an action RPG on because you can keep going all the way up into medieval times. And if there was like add-on packs, we can go all the way up to the laser guns. Now, in addition to that, we thought, wouldn't it be interesting if when man began, he didn't, he wasn't the only one who had a brain, it, like a big brain, like a thinking cognitive brain, the opposable thumb, whatever it was, right? He, there was insects that were like that, that were able to use tools and were able to have create language. Tools, language, you know, the whole thing. Culture, uh, the, the things that make, the thing that makes man so apparently great, okay? <laughs> of course, we don't spend a single day, do we, talking about how great we are without going, we're also pretty effed up. But nonetheless, let's just say we're great and man is going to go out there into the world and, um, and, 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 and conquer it. So the game's action RPG element, I think, re is hung on a much more powerful theme than Farm Boy or Farm Girl that just goes out there for revenge. Revenge is, you know, it's okay, but it's very cliche. I like building your empire as a theme. So now, when you go to build an empire, what happens? You run into someone or something that's trying to build its own empire. And guess what? They're not just standing out there with their ass in the wind. They've got an army. They've got technology. They've got walls. They've got towers. They're keeping you out of their yard. So what do you do? You build an army. You don't go out there single-handedly, woo, with the club you just picked off that dead guy. No, you start unloading your army of guys with clubs that you made because you learned how to make a club. You find a club, you go, hmm and you make your own club. So this is a really, this was a really fun idea. So I was telling people, you know, if you found soap, you'd be like, what's this soap thing, right? Oh, it's bubbly. But soap was one of those things in, in, in the history of man that actually increased our life expectancy by a huge percentage because we kept disease uh, under control as best we could. I mean, you ever heard that like we lived till we were 30 years old? You, you know, it, it's not hard. It's low hanging fruit, right? If you get to 40, you've given yourself 33% more life uh, by just doing a couple of simple things. Now we're getting kind of to the other end of that, that curve where it's like, we have to invent, we have to, we have to, we have to take apart the human genome in order to figure out how to solve uh, the next, the next thing. So it's getting a little more complicated to add even two years onto the end of the average life. But back then, it was easy and the, well, easier. And um, I'm sure if you asked them, they'd argue that. But the, um, the point is, is that you're fighting against all these other creatures so that we don't have to have a video game where you're just killing other human beings. Because I'll be honest with you, I've always tried to design games where I avoid killing humans. But, you know, killing humans, as it turns out, for humans is more fun than killing bugs and killing critters. This is also part of our human condition. We seem to like to only kill our own kind. So I, uh, I wanted an excuse and the guys, uh, we brainstormed and we came up with these ideas to, to, to fight these other, uh, these other critters. So, and then we thought it was kind of a fun alternate version of Earth history. Now, back again to the war zone. So you come across uh, this, this bug guy who's like got an army of bugs. And now when you kill him or you defeat him, 
the bug guy, you get to steal some tech that he's got. Maybe his bugs had bows, archery, and all you had was slings and rocks and clubs. So now you've got, you have a choice. Do do I want this weird soap thing or do I want this? Because it's a video game. We contrive it, right? We say you can choose. Do I want that thing where they can shoot projectiles? That looks pretty cool. Of course, we're we're, we're playing this in 2013 or 14. So, of course, we know damn well that we... We're making a video game decision and thinking, hmm, maybe I'll get the bow on the next guy because there'll probably be a bow, you know, there'll probably be another chance to get the bow or I'll pick up the soap later. Wait a second. Did I say I'll pick up the soap later? Oh, that's better than dropping the soap. But anyway, um, <laughs> the, 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 that's the game. The game is about playing these overland adventures with your, with your hero, your wild man, who gets less and less wild, frankly more and more powerful, less wild, and he fights these wars and steals technology and then continues on overland adventure. I, When this idea coalesced, this was like, this is magical in terms of the way I'm, these elements are coming together. We did a video. We tried to keep the video short. We tried to, we tried to explain it at a high level, like, like you were doing a movie trailer. Didn't work. The, what, the, the, the Kickstarter video has everybody scratching their head going, well, I don't know what the game is. So therefore, the pledges are just people who just say, Chris, GPG, we trust you. We, we know that you know, what, you know what you're doing. Da, 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 da. And that vote of confidence is wonderful. But it's at, what have we got, 6,000 pledges? Um, and we need to be at, you know, 18,000 pledges. So, you know, or more. Um, so, so God you know, God bless all the people out there who just believe that I know how to make video games because that's, that's what I'm seeing. They're saying, you know how to make video game. Here's my 150, $200, my 20 bucks, whatever it is. So, but anyway, do you have a clearer picture of wild man? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I civilization series has got to be one of the most addictive and my, one of my personal favorites. Just the idea of somehow combining that uh, with an RPG format is, uh, <laughs> where is that game i want that game now i appreciate that I appreciate that yeah I, I actually i actually want that game too now so if this doesn't fund i want to go back to project mercury and i want to build the game as it was originally intended and i will build it in my basement i will the company will be shut down and i will build it in my basement the thing is um i i i you know, I want people to know that it's not the end of the world. In fact, building it in my basement right now is starting to look better and better and better every day because of the enormity of the stress and the pain that I've experienced the last two weeks. I'm like, I'm like, I, I got to get through this. I can't wait to see how this movie is going to end because I got to get on with my life and, and, and turn the page here and, and, and start, start building again. Well, thanks a lot, Chris. It's been fun. <laughs> You know? <laughs> your your version of your, I, your I love to get these sort of insider views of all this oh, stuff. Oh, you would not believe I could talk for I could talk all day about what I've experienced the last fifteen years, and I know that there's only going to be a handful of people um, that are that find it uh, interesting. Um, uh, but I will tell you something: it's really important that I do not sound like I've got sour grapes. Um, I think it's been wonderful in so many ways, but it's also been. Um, it's been, it's, 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 there's painful. I, I think that there's, there's just, you know, one day I'll, I'll come up with a one sentence closer on how it all feels, but right now it, it is just what it is. And, uh, and I think the next, uh, the next 15 years, um, are probably going to be a little easier now that I know what I know. Thanks, Matt. It just makes me sad to see the things happening to, to uh, that's kind of happened to Chris kind of being shoved in this corner because he, he's one of the last people in the world that deserve this. You know, I've been doing this for 23 years now. I've worked for all kinds of different companies and different bosses. And uh, something I'll, I'll reiterate that I've said in other places, and I'm, you know, I am going to post my own little video on YouTube, just basically this fact so people understand is that, it's it, there's obviously there's wild man the game itself and I, it's fantastic I think some cool ideas are coming up with it I I hope that that people uh, everybody else will rally together and help kind of pull us over the line uh, but I also want to say something about Chris himself 
is um, I, I got to know Chris again, as I said before, um, is that we were both working for Cave Dog and he was working on Total Annihilation and I was working on Elysium, but his office was right next door to John Cutter's office. And so whenever I was going up and we were visiting and doing stuff, I saw Chris Taylor all the time. Um, but uh, then later on, when he moved over to to uh, Gas Powered Games and he got his, his gig going, I was one of the first people that he contacted to kind of let me know, say, hey, man, I got a new studio. I got some cool stuff. And then obviously that relationship is what eventually led the well, laid the groundwork for Dungeon Siege. Um, but in, uh, back in, I'm trying to remember, um, it's 2004. We were starting to work on on, on Supreme Commander. You know, we were uh, starting to do the the backstory for for Supreme Commander and and start to flesh out what the world was going to be. Working with a, a great guy at the time, um, Evan Pongress, who was uh, was working on it, and we did a lot of interaction together on stuff. So I'm I'm working on the Bible for the world, and about this time, my wife Jana was diagnosed with a with an extremely rare, dangerous form of breast cancer, um, which most of 50% of the people were, uh, were, were alive after two years. 30% of the people were alive after five. Um, and so uh, it was just, I was completely destroyed. I, we'd already gone through around, Jane had had breast cancer before. Uh, the thing about it is most people don't necessarily understand is there are different varieties of breast cancer. It's not a, a monolithic disease. There are all kinds of sub-varieties. So anyway, we're working on, on the, the Bible for Supreme Commander. And I was having a very hard time getting through everything else because all, all I'm thinking about is my future, is she going to be live, blah, blah, blah. And so Chris could see that I was having a real hard time with things. And at one point, he basically pulled me aside. He said, you know, you're, you know, said, I don't want you to worry about all this other stuff with Supreme Commander. I want you to go home take care of your wife she's the only important thing right now and he cut me a check he says go ahead go home take care of your wife and that's you know i want you to that's that's the only important thing in the world that's who chris taylor is and um that's why that man needs to stay in business because he cares about his employees he will fight for you he will do anything he can for you um, and, um, there are so many people, I, again, I've worked for all kinds of different people in the world, but he, he's one of those people that he crusaded for 40 hour work weeks that doesn't exist in the game industry anywhere else. They expect you're going to work a 70 hour work. Week. You know, uh, most game companies target, they look for people who don't, who are single, you know, they don't have wife, they don't have a kid. I don't have to pay insurance on them. I can work them 80 hours a week. And they don't care. They'll, they're just going to be glad to be there. And that's not Chris at all. You know, he cares that you have a personal life. He wants you to have a, a great life that's going on. And by God, you know, uh, that there's just no reason that that man should be put out, out of business. Um, and so, sorry, I'm just getting a little misty eyes and a little kind of emotional list here or whatever. But I will fight to the death for that man. Um, and so back. Wild Man, please. Uh, uh, it's a great game. They grass powered games make fantastic stuff, and make sure this guy stays in business. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Now, if you want to support the Wild Man Kickstarter, I have a link in the show notes to the page. You can pledge uh, whatever you would like. I think it starts at a dollar, uh, but if you donate more, uh, you can get. Uh, various pledge rewards, uh, reward packages. It's really exciting stuff. And you can get a box copy if you, I think it's 125 maybe for that, uh, 35 for a digital copy, all the way up to like $10,000 and all kinds of cool stuff. So uh, go there, check out the rewards, uh, find out what tier you want to come in at, and uh, please do that right away. <laughs> Another don't, don't put it off uh, because these guys really need to see a show of, su of fan support as soon as they can get it. It's, they need a shot in the arm, so to speak. So uh, let's go make that happen. Now, as always, I want to thank you if you've supported my show, uh, my efforts. Uh, some people uh, may not realize the, uh, the, the work that it takes to produce these shows. I spend hours uh, gathering footage, uh, rounding up people to interview, 
uh, editing uh, these files, uh, finding footage, uh, screenshots, and so on. It's a, a really time-consuming process that I enjoy, uh, but also, of course, uh, like to be rewarded for all my work. So if you think these shows are worth supporting, if you think uh, the, these efforts that I'm putting into uh, Match Hat is, is uh, worth uh, the time, uh, maybe it's also worth a few dollars. Uh, so please go to Match Hat, or I'm sorry, go to Armchair Arcade, uh, look for the Match Hat link in the top right corner of the page, and make a donation or set up a subscription. Again, whatever you are comfortable with and what you think the show is worth to you. I appreciate it very, very much. Now what about that Ale of the Week? Now this week I've got a, another one uh, from uh, good old Herbert. Uh, this is a BrewDog Hardcore IPA, clocking in at 9.2% alcohol, explicit imperial ale. Now as always, I have a, a wonderful write-up on the side of the bottle here. This imperial India pale ale rocks hardcore. But don't feel obliged to take our word for it. This little bottle has a grandiloquent story to tell. 2,204 malted Maris Otter grains gave all they had to offer the world to provide the robustly delicate toffee malt canvas for this ensuing epic. Four hop cones willingly sacrificed themselves in the fiery cauldron that is our brew kettle to ensure your mouth is left feeling punished and puckering for more. 9.9 .9 trillion yeast cells frantically fermented their little hearts out as the sugars were magically turned into alcohol in the dark depths of our fermentation tanks. Two humans and one canine companion are relatively happy with the results. Marvelous write-up. Let's get it open, though, <laughs> and see what it's all about. All right, so I have this hardcore IPA in the U. Rather excellent drinking horn here. A bit smelling this. It smells quite nice. Uh, we get a, of course, a very hoppy. You can almost smell the the bitterness here. Kind of peachy, uh, apricot, maybe a little blueberry. A very nice uh, aroma here. Uh, definitely no no alcohol uh, fumes uh, emanating from this. So, <laughs> you know, BrewDog seems to have a a flair for disguising all that alcohol uh, that's actually in the brew. Anyway, uh, here's to you, Herbert, and also uh, to you, uh, Chris. Uh, good luck with Wild Man. Here's to you. Oh, now that is, ooh. That is quite nice. Okay, the, yeah, there's a, the bitterness coming in. Uh, kind of a, a chocolatey, coffee, uh, sort of berry uh, flavor here. Uh, quite nice. A little nutty, uh, nutty flavor. It's nice and thick, very flavorful. Um, what is that? There's, there's maybe another flavor I can't quite put my... Uh, <laughs> I can't quite identify. But it's all nice, a very sophisticated uh, uh, ale. It's one of these you drink and then you taste three or four or five things and sort of follow following each other. So, uh, you know, if you've got a sophisticated palate, this is a very good choice. Just a, a really nice, uh, very nice selection here. Just, just the right amount of bitterness. I don't really taste any um, alcohol in this at all. 9.2%, I don't know how they do it. Uh, just a, a really, really nice ale. Uh, this is the the second one from BrewDog that I'm just uh, all around uh, greatly impressed with. I would definitely have this again and uh, strongly recommend it. I'm gonna go five out of five drinking horns again uh, on the uh, Hardcore IPA Explicit Imperial Ale from BrewDog. A very nice choice. Okay, uh, let's wrap up with a quotation. So for the quotation of the week, I found something from the late Steve Jobs. It goes something like this. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. See you guys next week. All right, let's go. Come on. You were more concerned about your horse. The horse I like. It's you I'm not so sure about. Wait till you get to know me better. <laughs>